So let's get stuck into long COVID and what we know in May 2023. Um, these are my disclosures. The most important one being that my unit's doing a couple of studies looking at, um, at the impact of long COVID in African cohorts, one of the few studies that actually are being done in Africans. So who, there, there are lots of um, synonyms for long COVID. I'm going to be using the term long COVID because it's the one that I think most of us use at the moment. But two years had COVID, put up your hands, documented COVID. Doesn't matter, PCR, antigen, you put up your hands. Okay, so I want to give you three cases. The first case is a devastatingly handsome 53-year-old um, 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 doctor with minimal comorbidities, had four vaccines, got Omicron in, um, in March of 2022, a 58-year-old um, major academic, She's had three vaccines. She also got Omicron a couple of months early during the initial um, phase of that epidemic. And a third case, um, somebody who got wild case, another major academic I know, who got wild case, um, a, wild, a wild type, and has had three, so four episodes of, of, of COVID. She's had um, several um, vaccines during that time. All of these, have, these people have got some form of long COVID. So now I want to know, those of you who put up your hands, who thinks they've got some form of long COVID? Put up your hands, don't be too shy. None of you. A couple of hands, they're not quite as like, high as I'd like them to be. So the first case has some moderate memory issues. The second case can't actually work a full day because they're so tired, they've got such severe memory issues. The third person is getting steadily um, progressively more short of breath with every subsequent case of COVID that they've had despite the vaccines. And they, they're just finding that the brain fog and the tiredness is getting steadily worse. Um, but I want to ask all the people, like each one of these people and each one of you I'm sure will be asked, come on, prove it. How do we know you've got long COVID? And this is one of the problems with COVID is that, is that with long COVID is that we lack an objective test, a blood test that we can do for long COVID. So in terms of COVID in general, I don't need to tell you, we had the initial cases at the end of 2019, and we had this massive wave, certainly in Africa, it started towards the end of March, April, um, sort of hit us a couple of months earlier in Italy and Europe, and then hit the States, North America, and the rest of the world. Um, the first cases, though, of people who survived COVID um, started to talk about you know, the respiratory symptoms, which were unsurprising because it looked like a conventional respiratory virus. Then the brain fog and the, the kind of, um, sort of mental problems of concentration and stuff. And that stuff persisted, those, those symptoms persisted. Um, but there was such a major emergency in 2020, those initial months, that nobody really had the capacity, I think, to pay attention to this. We very quickly also saw it in children, not in the numbers that we saw it in adults, but we saw it there as well. Um, there was increased attention towards the end of 2020 when it became very clear that it was an entity, but it was only really at the end of 2022 that, so that research money started being allocated, initially by the USA, um, a couple of billion dollars was being attached to the NIH, but even now I'm not aware of any money going through the EU that's been allocated um, to, to research on long COVID. Um, despite the fact that the estimate somewhere between depends which study you look at, some of these numbers don't really make sense to me totally, but somewhere between 10 and 20% by some estimates of people do it. We have no idea what that looks like in Africa because the studies haven't been done here. Um, so the crux is we definitely have this new entity, um, but we don't have this objective test yet. Um, People with long COVID are often sent away for objective testing. There's lots of tests looking at autonomic testing and they often get come away with a clean test. They don't have, they have significant symptoms, but the tests say that you're not, um, you don't have anything wrong with you and they get sent away. And the problem with that is probably because these tests are not great at detecting up the subtle differences around here. Um, the problem for this is that we have to allocate resources to this new entity and because we don't really know how big it is, we don't know how much money to give to the, the clinical allocations, we don't know what to put into guidelines, we don't know how much money to put, uh, allocate to researchers and people like the insurance companies don't know how to allocate how much money in terms of, 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 um, of, of, of disability claims. 
So some people initially would say, well, you know, the arguments around long COVID, it doesn't really matter. If somebody's depressed because of long COVID or they, you know, they have men uh, mental issues and stuff like that, you need to treat this. As a clinician, you need to treat what's in front of you. It doesn't matter where it came from. Get on with it and treat it. Um, the problem with that is that we may need different treatments if the, if the etiological factor is viral. If it's because of an ongoing inflammatory process because of the virus, or if it's depression because you lost your job or you lost family members during the initial waves, those are very different um, sort of pathways towards your depression. You might need different um, therapeutic interventions around that. And the problem with COVID is it's an absolute political disaster. You know, this is not just any old disease. We've all had to live through and continue to live through the nutcases that have come out of the woodwork to throw their hats into the ring when it comes to the COVID politics. We have everyone from the COVID denialists um, who pretend that this virus never existed in the first place to the minimizers who say it was just another little respiratory virus and never killed anyone at all. And these terrible Venn diagrams with the anti-vaxxers. Um, we have a whole lot of health insurance people and funders who want this to go away because they're worried it's going to cripple their financial base. We want governments who definitely want this to go away. Um, there's a whole lot of us, probably everybody in this room, we just want COVID to be over so we can get on with our lives. We've got me pre-COVID and me post-COVID because like, I'm much more sympathetic than I was um, before I got COVID. And then we've got a whole lot of patients who've had to fight their way through the system to get their, their diagnosis realized and who often get pushed away, and I'll show you why in just a moment. And then we've obviously got a whole lot of COVID researchers who want to be funded as quickly as possible in terms of this. And Ed Young, who's written a lot of very thoughtful articles for The Atlantic, um, has just this week come out of the woodwork again to write this article about how people are trying to make long COVID go away because it's just one of these uncomfortable things that um, public health people have to think about post-COVID. So it's important to remember that this might be a massive disabling event because even if only a tiny percentage of people who've had COVID um, get long COVID, because every one of us are going to get, have had COVID and probably are going to get COVID over and over again, uh, are going to get infected with the virus over and over again, that's a lot of people. And it has huge implications for, for all of us on an individual level, but also has huge implications for, for health systems. So this is my only pathophysiology slide. I'm just warning you, but it's a busy one. Um, so firstly, the immune, immunological reactions to, to, to SARS-CoV-2 is unique, They're, or there are aspects of it that are unique to this particular virus. And we're still unraveling it. We've learned an absolute huge amount of it um, about this. The, this is just one aspect that is unique, is the vascular damage that's done by the red cell aggregation. But there's a whole range of things about this virus that is still being learned about that is unique. So there is something about that around long COVID and the implications around long COVID that means that it's plausible that there is something about that is going to make it and the, the, the implications for this, this new chronic condition that is going to be unique. We also know that you know, age is such a strong predictor for, um, for, for mortality, for morbidity, and for and increasingly it's clear for long COVID. And that kind of makes sense. You know, that the immunological basis for this is going to be different. So the various hypotheses that have come out of the woodwork um, um, for long COVID, the one is that there's some sort of viral persistence. Either the virus continues to grow inside you, a bit like HIV, or some, perhaps like some sort of thing that hides out, a bit like the herpes viruses, or maybe some sort of persistence of various viral proteins. Um, there might be some sort of chronic inflammatory um, process, and the virus does weird things. There have been mice models where it shows that even with mild respiratory infections, it sets up um, brain inflammation in these mice uh, that's ongoing up to a year later. Uh, there are all sorts of weird autoimmune markers that, that seem to occur during the inflammatory process. There's, um, um, there's autonomic dysfunction galore that happens with the virus that, uh, that, is, uh, that, that is a real pain in the neck when it comes to the clinical manifestation in terms of, 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 of trying to deal with it. And then there's the reactivation of latent viruses. And in fact, the reactivation of EBV is a major risk factor for, um, for long COVID symptoms. And we're also worried about uh, many of the other herpes viruses. So that all of these hypotheses are important to, to try and claw your way through because you don't want to give anti-inflammatories to something if it's a viral reactivation and you may not want to give antivirals if the problem is, is, um, is autonomic dysfunction. So these are the manifestations and there are over 200 um, symptoms now described for long COVID. And I 
confess I had to Google some of these things because I hadn't actually heard of them. And you can see the incredible range of symptoms that are now described with, uh, with long COVID. Um, the vast majority of these are symptoms, not actual objective signs. Um, they, um, a lot, uh, you know, these self-reported symptoms are now categorized. They're being increasingly recognized and described in different populations and at different ages. Um, and a lot of these, these, the problem with this is that patients are, are disbelieved. And, and, and I think we get this. The, um, there's a long history to these, 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 these post-viral um, um, uh, syndromes that's where um, we see it with ME and a couple of the other syndromes where you know, we're clinicians. You kill the bug, the patient should get better. We don't believe that there should be anything around. And it, it's clear that this is actually not the case with many of these symptoms and with many of these post-viral states. Um, we're only starting to see that there might be associations with even longer-term consequences, such as cardiovascular disease. Now, this, some of this is just speculative. It's not very clear, because the people who get this really badly are people who are already predisposed to cardiovascular disease. So what are the risk factors? The first couple of things up there are the, thing, the same risk factors that we see for severe COVID. But things at the bottom there are really interesting is whether you didn't rest after your acute infection, that um, whether uh, you can see evidence of persistence of the, of, of the disease, whether certain autoantibodies, whether the, some of those viral proteins are sticking around, and whether you had vaccines, particularly after the, before the primary infection. Obviously, very few people left around who've had, who haven't had the primary infection. And then what's increasingly being recognized in very early research, including in a recent Lancet publication in kids, is whether you've had repeated infections. Um, that seems to predict for long COVID. Now, this um, little bit of research, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it from here, you probably can't, has just came out in August 2022, but demonstrated that if you had severe symptoms um, during any acute attack, that seems to predict for, um, for the persistence of your long COVID symptoms and the severity of your long COVID symptoms. So again, it seems like you know, that something's going on there with, um, with the amount and the intensity of, 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 the, of the COVID um, responses that you get, the immunological responses that you can get. What's interesting is that one consensus is around the, co the WHO definition of long COVID. And this came out in around towards the end of 2021 through a Delphi consensus meeting. There's a huge amount of anger towards this process, which was interesting. But essentially, it's about having the symptoms three, more than three months after the infection for at least two months um, with no other explanation. So it's quite a uh, those of us involved in clinical medicine are quite used to these kind of definitions for these, for these kind of things. With these kind of this constellation of, of these symptoms, um, quite, um, and um, the, the, with these very typical clinical symptoms, these are the more common ones. You can see on the right hand side there, kind of categorization at the time. These keep getting moved up and down according to whatever research is coming out at the moment. Um, the NIH has started to use, for, for studies starting to address um, symptoms, to try to categorize them into three areas, um, looking at um, respiratory and neurological, and then just broader symptoms, uh, mainly around fatigue, to try and see around therapeutics, um, and to, to, to start um, looking at patients with um, easy to categorize things that they can enroll in studies, um, as well as um, some of these um, some of these questionnaires using the PROMISE questionnaires and uh, other additions around autonomic testing. So it really is a work in progress. Um, but the, it's important to recognize patients often have to run a gauntlet of disbelief, often with healthcare workers who just think that it's all psychosomatic, they're making these things up, you're just a little bit depressed and who can't be depressed after what we've all been through. Um, they often have to run past their family and their friends, um, and they just don't get access to the care that they need. And as I said, some of those symptoms I had to Google, you know, you can see why. And you can say, oh, my hair's falling out, and you're like, there's really something wrong with you, you know. Um, and it's really important that we do try and find some biomarkers to start monitoring firstly for diagnosis and again, trying to get these objective measures, but in the future when we're starting to look for therapeutics, trying to get other mechanisms other than symptom report to try and get this going. But we might well be in a situation going into the future where symptoms and report is what we're going to need to rely upon. Um, and these are just some of the timelines that you see with some of the symptoms. The tiredness, and I think we all know this, and those of you who've had symptomatic COVID will know this, the tiredness is extremely common um, and tends to resolve quite slowly. The neurological consequences are often um, 
resolve very slowly. They actually sometimes get worse. Um, the respiratory and gastrointestinal symptoms tend to get better and resolve fairly quickly, which is um, um, reassuring. Pain, um, which can be almost everywhere, but in my experience, certainly joint pain um, with patients has been significant and tends to improve, but improves very, very slowly and can manifest quite late, months after the infection. Um, the, the varioparosmias and things like that um, classically is fairly acute, and I think many of you will have experienced that for yourselves, where you have your taste goes, goes completely wonky. And then the autonomic symptoms can occur almost across almost all timelines and can be really scary for patients. So can it be prevented? Well, repeat, we now know that repeated infections seem to predict for long COVID. The severity cor is correlated with long COVID and that vaccines protect you from both. The variants, each subsequent variant seems, the vaccines seem to be less protective from infection. But what we're seeing here is that um, is that there might be a role for antivirals. Unfortunately, getting the antivirals into you during an acute episode of, of COVID is actually a real challenge. And we certainly have experienced now from large studies we've been doing in South Africa, they're finding patients with acute COVID to enroll in studies for, um, for antivirals is, is very difficult. There's been some promising studies with um, Paxlovid um, and that, um, and more recently, but I'll come back to that in just a moment. But the current advice is to prevent long COVID is try to prevent yourself getting SARS-CoV-2 in the first place, which can be obviously very, very challenging. There is a study from, um, from uh, Rob Brewer's group, which does all the amazing work with acute COVID, but in a sub-study of an NEGM study, which looked at ivermectin, fluvoxamine, and metformin, which didn't work in acute COVID, um, actually demonstrated remarkably that metformin worked pretty well to, to, to stop um, long COVID. Unfortunately, the study was only done in people who didn't, had never had COVID in the first place. So people who were naive to SARS-CoV-2 and we don't have those patients anymore. So can long COVID be treated? Well, the one thing we do know is that you should not exercise. There have been a couple of studies now looking at um, patients who had in, uh, inducted into exercise programs and the vast majority of patients did a lot worse. The numbers who actually did better were vanishingly small. So there's some firm advice and I was just wondering through the interwebs and so quite a lot of programs um, advocating exercise programs and I just think that that must be done very carefully because we all go to exercise as only being good for you. The therapeutics are all new. The one study there that is going forward, and there's a very promising study that came out in JAMA in March looking at Paxlovid, um, long-term Paxlovid. There's a big RCT ongoing, um, was using Paxlovid. But you can see there's a huge number of things being um, addressing them. Nothing is ready for prime time yet. Um, I see people are, um, taking photographs of the slide. Wait for the next one. This is the one you need to really be looking at um, to really get um, freaked out. Um, and the important thing to remember is even if we do know what the pathophysiology of all these, uh, once we get the hypothesis sorted out, it doesn't mean these drugs work. Even when you work out how these things, that, that we know from so many of these COVID studies that that doesn't mean the drug that you're choosing is going to sort out. And this study, which came out um, towards the end of last year, and which is also freely available, just some heroic work from the, the authors put together all the studies being looking at long COVID. And you can see this astonishing number of, um, of interventions, not just pharmacological interventions, but all sorts of, of, um, of sort of exercise, rehab, alternative medicine, you name it, in this, this particular publication um, put together. And it really is remarkable what people are out there doing. But we have nothing yet to actually treat them for us. So what, to end off, can we do with our poor patients? And this is where it actually is a little bit depressing, is remember, I'm just reminding you about our three, and these people are all various degrees of disability. Um, so the first I think, and I think I certainly personally have found is, is to believe them. Don't dismiss their symptoms. And I think that is a huge first step, is to say, to acknowledge that their symptoms are real. And I think that that often is just the first and big help. And to also acknowledge that people have been through a terrible time over the last three years. You know, I think we all want to move on, but it has been harsh. And I think often these people have been left in the hands of healthcare workers that haven't believed them. And just that first step is a, is a big step forward. Um, there may be multiple symptoms um, that may be evolving over time, and you may not be able to handle them. I mean, I looked at those 200 symptoms, I don't think I could handle about 180 of them. So you may have to refer these people on, and the, you may have to 
deal with what you've got at hand. Some of that stuff, I, I don't know how you deal with hair loss for that matter. You know, honestly, I, um, they're going to be packed off to a dermatologist as quickly as I can get them because I haven't got a clue what to do with that, as you can tell. Um, and things like autonomic dysfunction, you really may need to get them into the hands of a specialist that can deal with that. And you may not have a friendly um, neurologist that you can send them to, in which case you're just going to have to do the best that you can. Um, you, there's lots of appeals to multidisciplinary care teams. And I don't know about you, but most of my American colleagues who work in very well-resourced areas just rolled their eyes and said they don't have access to multidisciplinary care teams. And this fun little BMJ article was talking very cynically about how multi multidisciplinary care teams often do a lot of harm because they just tie them up in so many meetings and so many consultations that the patients are exhausted and never want to come back again. So that was quite an interesting little like observation. But I think that there are online resources. Um, there's this, what I found one of the most was this particular one, which looked at pain management, which was interesting for me because I learned a lot during the HIV bad years on how to deal with pain from the hospice people. And this one really used a lot of the stuff I knew from those bad years to focus on COVID management and use the, the various analgesics, cheap, easy, safe analgesics that I could use for COVID. And then WHO had a lot of help and self-management tools. A bit depressing again because it was kind of like, you know, just you, you're on your own Joe type stuff and these are the things you can do. But the sort of combination of physio and staying active and all the rest of the stuff. What you can do within all of this is start becoming, in my last slide, is just become an empathic ally to what I think is a lot of suffering out there. Try and balance that with being a good scientist keep arguing for the good science and try and get it out there as much as you, um, as you can. And try and communicate the uncertainty of the diagnosis and how much we don't know about long COVID I think is an important thing. Um, I think it's important to, people that, to tell people that it's going to improve and resolve in the majority of people, but that in many people, a significant minority, it is still going to be pretty disabling. Um, I think we need to be pushing for African data. Um, we, I don't know how we're experiencing long COVID, if it's any different from North America or Europe or Asia. Um, that, uh, you know, I think we need to start thinking about African treatments. We don't do well with treating depression. We don't deal with treating vague things like tiredness and all the rest of it. Are we going to be able to do with that? And then think about the practical interventions that we might be able to offer. Yeah, I have, a lot of, I have a lot more trust in us trying to get more vaccines out there than I do with getting multidisciplinary specialized clinics for long COVID, you know, into rural areas in Africa. So I do think that we need to be reflecting on what's practical and possible before we start shouting for more and more resources for these things. And this is where I think the public health and clinicians and all of us need to put our heads together and start asking for what can we do and get as much data as possible as to what we're actually seeing practically out there. Thank you very much.